Hi, you're very welcome today to Donegal ETB's information session on apprenticeships. Donegal ETB has responsibility for several craft apprenticeships and also we have an administration team that you can contact if you have any queries in relation to anything that comes up here today. We have a fantastic panel available. We have Lorraine Murray, Senior Training Advisor in Apprenticeships. We have Anthony O'Donnell, who's an instructor in carpentry and joinery in our Letterkenny Training Centre. And we have Tara Maguire, who's the Fret Recruitment Officer for Donegal ETB. So today we're going to look at some of the most commonly asked questions in the area of apprenticeship. The first one that most people will ask Lorraine is, how do I become an apprentice? Well, Deirdre, firstly you have to decide on which apprenticeship that you're actually interested in. There's a lot of apprenticeships out there at the moment, so you know it's important to do a little bit of research around what your interests and you know where you'd like to um, focus your career. And it's also important to note that apprenticeship, as you said, is earn and learn model of training. You have to find an employer who's willing to take you on in the particular occupation or trade that you've decided to pursue as an apprentice. If the apprenticeship isn't one of the traditional craft um, trades and the employer that you're speaking to or is willing to take you on has already had apprentices in the past then it's a relatively quick and simple process to register. Uh, however, if they haven't had apprentices in the past, it just means that myself or, or my colleague Claire, who also deals with apprenticeship in Donegal ETB, would undertake to do a site visit with the employer to determine their suitability to train apprentices. And there's some criteria that they have to meet, obviously, and we would go through that with them. It doesn't take too long, but it's just an additional uh, process uh, that has to take place. If the apprenticeship is one of the newer uh, occupations since 2016, uh, then it would be important. They all have very different eligibility criteria. It would be important for you to, as an apprentice or a prospective apprentice, to research that on apprenticeship.ie on the website or contact myself and Claire and we can go through the eligibility criteria and how you know you may progress uh, in terms of tying up with an employer. Uh, some of the, the national apprenticeships that are, are new, they have lead uh, providers which can do some do some screening on behalf of employers, and you might have to go through an application or you know a different registration process than you would do if it was the traditional crafts. So there's a few things coming through strongly there, Lorraine. First and foremost is if I'm interested in apprenticeship, I need to be clear about which apprenticeship I'm interested in. Secondly, I need to maybe be very clear around an employer and identify an employer possibly have made an approach there. And lastly, just that I need to do my research and just see how many apprenticeships and the range of, of opportunities that are there for me. A lot of young people, uh, predominantly maybe young people, but adults as well, come, come say to the guidance service and they'll ask questions like, what qualifications do I need to become an apprentice? Well, the basic eligibility criteria in terms of educational qualifications um, for the traditional crafts is five Ds in your junior cert. Now, that's a minimum eligibility criteria and employers can look for more than that and they often do. Uh, over 80% of the apprenticeship population at the moment would have their leave insert. And a lot of the, the traditional crafts uh, would involve math throughout the curriculum for the four years. And employers do look for uh, particularly math and the results that you would have maybe in your leave insert. So that's important for people to know. While there's a basic minimum entry criteria in terms of educational uh, criteria, uh, employers can set the bar higher than that and often do. I mean, uh, it's a four-year apprenticeship which is a big commitment for those if it's the traditional crafts and for them to make that commitment they want to try to ensure insofar as is possible that the apprentice succeeds and gets out the other end with a qualification so they invest their time their energy and financial commitment to taking an apprentice through uh, for those four years and they want to ensure that you know there's a successful outcome at the end of that so um, for both them and the, the apprentice so it is important for, for prospective apprentices to know the importance of maths, that employers are, are looking at those grades, and, and also that when you go out there to compete for an apprenticeship, that it's something that employers are looking for, and along with other things as well. So I think the message coming through very strongly there is, whilst the minimum criteria might be five Ds in the junior cert, the reality is quite often employers are looking for leave insert. Yeah, and that's specifically for the traditional trades in terms of their eligibility, educational edu eligibility criteria. Other apprenticeships like the insurance practitioner at level 8, the, the, the newer ones, uh, range um, also from level 5 up to level 10. So some of them are at um, degree level. And it's important, again, going back to the research, that you would either research online or talk to myself or my colleague in, in Donegal ETB with regards to those so just there, like in terms of, of the uh, educational requirements for some of the newer apprenticeships and, you know, the insurance practitioner, for example, requires it's, it's a level eight honours degree uh, th that you're doing um, and pursuing. So for that one, the uh, eligibility criteria is 
two honours in higher level papers, um, and then four passes to include um, English and maths um, or Irish as well. So you know it's important just to be aware of all of all of the different criteria for the various um, apprenticeships um, across the board. So as the whole field of apprenticeships has diversified, there's definitely not a one size fits all. There's when definitely it comes to not, and there are other eligibility criteria aside from um, you know the educational side of it as well. For example, the traditional craft area like electrical and plumbing. Uh, where colour vision would be important. So there's a specific Ishihara colour vision test that's that's required that, that you have to pass um, before you can enter into that apprenticeship. So there's a number of things that you have to take to bear in mind. I suppose uh, if you have a, perhaps a young person or somebody who's looking to reskill in another area and they're coming in and, you know, they're maybe not from traditional trade families or, they you know, they want to explore apprenticeship for the first time. Is there any advice that you can give to people around approaching an employer or around seeking an apprenticeship? Maybe Anthony, you take that one. Before approaching a potential employer, maybe you should uh, research your chosen craft apprenticeship. So there's a number of ways you can do that. You can talk to craftspeople within the trade or maybe apprentices and find out their experience, uh, gather knowledge from them, what, what you need to know and find out what type of work has been involved in it. And I would also advise if before approaching the employer to research the employer, maybe their products that they do, maybe their service they, that they provide, and just get, get out of that bit of knowledge that maybe the employer may ask you when you contact them. Because we, I, I suppose I dared, uh, uh, these are young adults, maybe 16, 17 years of age, maybe going out into the workforce for the first time, and they're going to be anxious, and they're going to be nervous. And they'll be wanting to find out what's the employer going to ask me what do we need to know so if you prepare yourself and have that wee bit of knowledge that'll just calm the nerves a wee bit and you must remember too the employer also will know that you're nervous because he or she was there before looking for work so they're going to know that but if you have some answers for them and even to know a bit about yourself because they may ask about yourself also so just gather a, as much knowledge as possible of your chosen apprenticeship and your uh, employer or the company that you're looking for and also yourself. Maybe Lorraine, you'll take it over from there now. It's really important to, you know, to, do, to do the research in that and, and employers, they're really interested to see that you have a, um, an interest in their occupation and that, you have, that you're knowledgeable about the apprenticeship that you're um, wanting them to take them on in and that you, um, that you have a passion to learn. That would be important as well. Uh, they also want to see that you have a good attitude, a good positive attitude. Good communication skills are important. Timekeeping and, you know, some transferable skills that you can demonstrate. If, if, you, if you've worked part time somewhere before, if you have if you have sporting interests, if you're, a, you know, a good team player, they would be transferable skills that an employer will be able to see that, well, if you have a part time jo job, it's likely you're a good timekeeper. And um, if you're playing sport, you're probably good at communication skills. You know, you're a good team player. Um, and that uh, if it's an outdoor sport that you're willing to be out in all weathers, uh, some of the some of the traditional crafts, you know, that would be an important thing for an employer to know. If you have been working on more practical subjects in secondary school and you have built up a bit of a portfolio or you have some photographs that you would have, or if, if you have a hobby or an interest in that particular field uh, and you've done a bit of work at home in the garage and you have some projects that you can demonstrate your ability in those areas, that's also employers like to see that as well. So uh, it would be important to have some evidence with you, um, build your CV up and include those things. Sometimes I find that people of all ages don't realise the transferable skills that they do have um, and that maybe they've built up even over a career or that when they come out of school, even that they already have. And it would be important to include those and be able to show them in, in a CV. It would be also important for a young person um, who's, you know, not used to being out there and, and putting herself um, forward in that uh, employer scenario to be aware of a few things like mobile phone usage, um, their social media, how they appear on social media. There are things that employers also look at. So uh, be careful of what you post on your social media. If you're looking for an apprenticeship, employers do look. I suppose it's important as well that you, you make that connection yourself. If you're if you're ringing an employer to make an appointment or to see if they have a vacancy or, or they have a vacancy and you're looking to put in a CV, then it would be important to uh, make the, the contact yourself um, and not have somebody else do it for you. Employers like to see, even if you're nervous, 
you know, practice at home, your interview types, you know, your first um, sentence and what you're going to say and how you're going to sell that, sell yourself, you know, do that at home with somebody else um, or with your career guidance teacher so that you're comfortable in that setting where, you know, we're not very good at selling ourselves and uh, it would be important to, to practice that before you make um, an approach to an employer. And um, aside from that, just put the best foot forward um, and, you know, have an up-to-date CV and, uh, and take it from there. Tara, have you anything you'd like to add? So I suppose one of the things that we would encourage a young person is to look to see what other courses that they may be able to take on, for example, to improve their skills, because you won't secure an apprenticeship overnight. It will take some time. So things like um, maybe if you're considering an apprenticeship in plumbing, for example, or motor mechanics, we would have courses in welding. And we would encourage a person, you know, that's the type of skill that will it'll always stand you in good stead. It's very transferable. And if you've approached an employer and they don't have a job immediately and you go back to that particular employer in six months time, well, they will ask, what have you been doing since I last spoke to you? They want to see that you're actively engaged in building that skill set. So, you know, you don't need to be sitting about idly waiting for a job to appear. That's not going to happen. It's going to take some time. So you have to persevere and be persistent and at the same time continuously be working towards improving, I suppose, what you can offer the employer. So in addition to maybe taking on a course, you might work towards obtaining your driver's license, for example. You might even take on part-time work if you can get it. So that's one of the things that we would always encourage, whether you're young, coming directly from school, or you're a career changer, you know, build those skills all of the time and you will get there in the end. Wow, that's brilliant. That's very good, you know, real advice for people. You know, you're talking about knowledge, knowledge of the employer, knowledge of yourself. You're talking about courage, put yourself forward to make that call and do that. And maybe a wee bit of uh, resilience. You may not just get there on the first try. So you just got to go back and think about developing the skills in the meantime. It's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, a very common question, particularly among maybe people looking to reskill if they have family commitments or young people that maybe haven't had much life experience yet. Might be something along, can I stay in Donegal if I want to do an apprenticeship? You know, so uh, Anthony, any thoughts? Uh, well, that's the million dollar question, I suppose. Uh, we'd all like to stay in Donegal, but the traditional apprenticeship is based over seven phases. So it's broken into seven phases. You have phase one, phase three, phase five and phase seven. And they're all delivered what we call on the job by the employer. So although your employer might be Donegal based, that's not necessarily that you'd be working in Donegal. You could be working anywhere in Ireland. So you have to be mindful of that, that you may have to travel within that. That's not to say that you won't be working in Donegal, but you could be working elsewhere in the country also. Now, within them phases, you'll have tasks to do in one, three, five, and seven, and each one gets difficulter as they, as they go along. Now, you have the, what we call off the job or the educational phases, and that's delivered in phase two, four, and six. And I suppose when you have all the seven completed, all your exams passed and a minimum of four years completed, then that's, that gives you your level six advanced craft certificate. I suppose that's your seven steps to success, uh, if you want to look at it like that. And maybe Lorraine, you could go into more detail on the apprenticeship. Well, I suppose just in terms of uh, can you do it in Donegal, um, and Deirdre, the short answer to that is uh, there's no guarantee that you will do any of it in Donegal even if your employer is based here, because they may be working, you know, five days a week in Dublin uh, and, you know, their registered office is, is Donegal. But for the most part, lots of, of employers based in, in Donegal do work in Donegal. So those phases one, three, five and seven, when you're with the employer, are usually um, based in Donegal. Uh, for the phases two, four and six, they can be anywhere in the country. Um, while Donegal ETB do offer... Uh, some of the, the craft apprenticeships at phase two, which is a 22 week phase block release uh, in both Gidoro training centres and in Letterkenny training centre. And you may be lucky to, you know, be placed there for that phase two for the particular trades that's covered, like electrical, plumbing, electronic security system, motor mechanic, carpentry and joinery. But you may not. It's a national programme. Uh, and um, there's a national wait list. It's a solace coordinated programme. And so whoever's at the top of the list, no matter whether from Dublin or Donegal, you know, they can't be overlooked. So if the first next place available is in a Donegal training centre and that person that's next on the list 
is in, from Dublin or Galway or Sligo, then the place is offered to them. Um, you know, it's a four year programme. So that's the phase two. But the phase four and six are in the Institutes of Technology normally. Uh, for the apprenticeships that aren't in the traditional craft area, they can be anywhere in the country and they, and they don't follow that seven phase model that was alluded to earlier. They range from levels five up to level 10. Uh, they have a duration from two years upwards. You know, we mentioned earlier, some are at a degree level. And, and therefore, they're also based, you know, can be based anywhere in the country. So while some of those even at degree, like the insurance practitioner apprenticeship, has a large element of, of online learning, it's blended. So that one, you can do your degree and uh, be based for the most part in Donegal because the learning at, at third level, the training is delivered um, through online live lectures one day a week. So the apprentice is with their employer, the insurance company, for four days of the week. And on the fifth day, they uh, log on to live stream lectures through Sligo IT or Galway, whichever um, IT is delivering it. So that one, you know, is one that's, you know, you are mainly in Donegal for. So there's a, a wide variety of options. Sometimes for the new apprenticeships, you could be in, uh, in a, an educational or training centre two days a week and with an employer, the other three. So it's not the block phased release for the manufacturing engineering, for example, the level seven um, degree. It is three 15-week block releases in Sligo IT. So you're with the employer for the rest of the time over a period of three years, and then you have three 15-week blocks. So they do vary a lot, and that's back again to the research. It's important to know. Um, but um, yeah, so that's that's basically. There's no, um, I suppose, one answer. This is a theme that seems to be emerging, is that you really need to have done your research and ask the right questions, you know, if you're considering yeah. an apprenticeship. Tara? Tell me, can you give any advice maybe on where apprenticeships might be advertised or can Donegal ETB help me find an apprenticeship employer? Yes, yeah, certainly, Deirdre. I suppose the first thing to do is really look to your own network. You know, you're going to have to do your research. Family and friends can be a really useful point, you know, in, in this, I suppose, in this area of it. So you want to really look to your own family and friends. Who do you know that works in the industry or the sector that you have an interest in? And you want to approach those individuals. You want to make sure that you do a little bit of preparation before you approach them, write out questions, you know, ask them things like, what do they like about the job? What do they find challenging about the job? Maybe what challenges are they facing as an industry? You know, so you want to do a little bit of homework and definitely start with your own network of people. And um, that's probably the best starting point when you're looking for an apprenticeship. And Lorraine will certainly have some more, you know, tips as to where they'll be advertised and how you source them. Supposed to build on, on Tara there, what she's saying, in terms of the network, it's vital. Uh, you know, employers do recruit, um, especially in the traditional crafts, through word of mouth. So it's important in that regard to let your network know that uh, you're looking for an apprenticeship or you have an interest in apprenticeship. Um, you know, you could be playing sport. It could be uh, if you're looking for an electrical apprenticeship, maybe your your manager or your co coach's brother is is an electrician. You know, so that network you're not thinking about, it's important to be aware of. The other thing that would be important would be local media and, you know, t to make sure that you're aware of, of local, local media and employers also recruit through Facebook. If you're still at school, career guidance teachers, we would often, um, you know, direct employers to career guidance teachers in school because that's where, where um, you know, a lot of people come through and, and they identify there first that they're interested. So they may have somebody that's that's leaving school or, or is looking for a work placement or something in, in, in TY. Following apprenticeship.ie on, on Facebook, uh, Generation Apprenticeship on Facebook and Twitter, um, and on LinkedIn, all the, the various social media uh, platforms as well is important. So other websites uh, like apprenticeshipjobs.ie would be a, another good place um, to look where you can search by county location where employers may advertise there as well freely. Indeed.ie or Safe Electric, some websites that are particularly um, focused on uh, maybe an occupation or a sector as well are, are, are good to um, to, to log on to and explore. And Donegal, a lot of it would be word of mouth and um, it would be important to use the networks in your wider network as well, as Tara said. So it's very interesting that when you're seeking apprenticeship opportunities, the trend very much follows the standard workforce. You know, word of mouth is by far the best recommendation. Yeah, and it's it would be important to, to realise, you know, um, how much, uh, I suppose, in terms of first impressions as well, that you're making all the time when you don't realise it because um, uh, recruitment can be local 
when it's a traditional craft. So, you know, if you are on a football team or you are, you do have a part time job, whether it be in a bar or a, a local shop, you know, there's always employers, prospective employers coming and going all the time and observing you in these different areas and spaces. And um, also, again, you know, we mentioned your uh, earlier, your social media platform. So so it's important to be aware of when you're being observed and, and when, you know, when you can be making impressions when you don't realise that you even are. So, dear, in terms of the, the, the new apprenticeships, it would be important, like some of the uh, recruitment for those can take place at a national level with the industry leads coordinating or managing the process as well. So it would be important for a prospective apprentice that's, that's looking maybe um, for an opportunity in one of those newer occupations, if it's ICT apprenticeship or finance or, or in the sales area or pharma, any of those, to uh, log on to apprenticeship. the www.apprenticeship.ie website and uh, look at the various options there and what's because there's links to all of the the coordinating provider and the, and the leads um, that are looking after recruitment there as well. It can happen locally, but it can also happen nationally. There may be some aptitude tests involved or, um, you know, pre-selections. And the main thing is perseverance and not to be disappointed if on your first approach to an employer that you don't secure an apprenticeship uh, first out of the gate. Sometimes um, you may catch employers on a on a bad day. Maybe they're filing their tax returns. Who knows? Um, not a good day to approach anybody. So be mindful. Uh, sometimes employers can be very busy. On that particular day, recruitment is not a priority for them, uh, even if you hand in the CV. So if you don't hear back from an employer, you know, if you've left the CV or made an approach, then do go back to them within a few weeks or a month. I had various incidents and experiences with with apprentices or prospective apprentices that um, maybe one in particular that I can think of at the minute started at the the mountaintop in Letterkenny and uh, went all the way to Pankrana and had every garage en route trying to secure a motor mechanic apprenticeship. Um, and on the first time out, he, he didn't get an apprenticeship. On the second time out, a month later, he didn't secure an apprenticeship. But on the third time, it was third time lucky, and it was about the perseverance. And, you know, employers saw that this is a lad that's definitely interested in this area, um, determined and focused, you know, he got his apprenticeship on the third time. So perseverance is a big thing. Really good tip as well, Deirdre, particularly for the school leavers, is use their work experience opportunities. So if they're doing the TY year or their work experience as part of the Leaving Cert programme, make sure that you're selective. You know, you don't take the easy route in terms of a work experience opportunity. If you're thinking about apprenticeship, regardless of whether it's craft or the newer apprenticeships, choose that employer very wisely because that can be your inroad and the start of your network as well. And equally as well, we would say that if you're in a further education training programme, again, be very clever about where you select your work experience, because that can be the stepping stone into an apprenticeship as well. It's fantastic. It's great advice, you know, and it's maybe stuff that it's quite simple, but it's stuff that maybe we overlook. And, and, you know, when we're feeling a bit stressed and under pressure looking for an apprenticeship. Anthony, one of the the most common questions for us would be, uh, look, if I did a traditional craft apprenticeship, what's the balance between theory and practical? Because there can be a wee bit of an assumption that if I take a traditional trade, maybe the books are in the corner and it's all about what I can do with the hands. Well, there is a misconception with the craft traditional apprenticeships where you obtain an employer, if you're lucky enough to obtain an employer, and for the next four years, you throw the school bag or the textbooks in the corner. That's it. You don't see them no more. That couldn't be any farther from the truth. Uh, as, long, as well with your practical-based classes, there's also uh, classroom-based subjects. So these can comprise of uh, theory-based, they, uh, pr- uh, technical drawing, mathematics, communications, team leaderships. So if you take, for example, if we break it down into percentages, so approximately in the electrical trade, uh, you have 55% practical, 45% uh, theory. In the motor mechanics, you'd have 50% theory, 50% practical. And in the carpentry joinery, you'd have 65% uh, practical, 35% theory. That's approximately the percentage breakdown of each of the trades that I've just mentioned. Uh, what that in that as well, there's a very high standard for a pass rate. So you take, for example, the electrical apprenticeship and the motor mechanics. You have to obtain 70% in your theory exam to achieve a pass. So that's very that's very high. And, and rightly so, rightly so. Because uh, th- th- we want to train them up to as high standard as possible. Uh, in the carpentry and joinery, you're looking at the technical drawing exam where you are given four drawings. And within them four drawings, you have to complete the four to achieve a minimum of a pass. So there is very, very high standards within the craft apprenticeship. 
Uh, we had uh, an apprentice there a number of years ago and he was finding it difficult with his theory and to the point that he wasn't going to continue with his apprenticeship. He, he thought he, he wasn't fit for it. But we knew in our own heart and soul that he was more than able for it. But he was young, as we we're talking about again, and he was anxious and it was his first time away from home and he was missing his family. We have to be mindful of all that. But thankfully, we encouraged him and he stayed on and he finished his, his craft apprenticeship. And I met him there only last year. And talk about a contrast and, and, and chalk and cheese, really, it was. Totally different person. He was very confident. He was career driven. And he just has started his own company. And he has six employees working for him. And what he said was, thanks, he says, for maybe encouraging me. Thank, thank for himself, not for us, that he continued on with his apprenticeship, that he mightn't be in the position he is today. So if things get tough, if things are worth doing, they're going to be difficult to do, aren't they? So, that's, so, so if things get tough, just proceed on with that. So what I'm saying is to achieve your level six advanced craft apprenticeship, uh, you're going to have to enhance your practical base skills. But you have to be mindful that you have to be self-motivated to learn all the theory within the craft. I mean, that would be my experience from employers as well. And, and I suppose it's like it's, it's gone back again to the recruitment stage and why they look at maths and, 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 and why they look at leave insert and why they sometimes don't recruit from the minimum um, five days in a junior cert base because they want to have an apprentice that you know that has the best chance of succeeding yeah. over the four years um, and, it, and it is challenging. So yeah, it would be important. Uh, I mean, I have apprentices that never thought that they'd be in a library um, studying in the evenings. That was kind of uh, definitely far from where they had envisaged themselves when they, when they were going down what they thought was a practical route. And we, we are mindful of that. We're constantly, uh, you know, explaining that to both parents, um, to prospective apprentices and to career guidance counsellors, uh, you know, across the county and beyond, just so that people are prepared, you know, apprentices are prepared for what's ahead of them. You do find that apprentices are much more interested and engaged with theoretical aspects of the curriculum because it's applied to the um, practical um, career that they're wanting to follow. So therefore, you know, while, while they may not have engaged or liked it so much uh, in secondary school, they're more likely uh, to succeed in it when it's related to something they like doing. And that's the importance of having, again, having the, the passion to learn. And you can be passionate about what you're learning when it's what you want to do as your career. It's that choice initially that is, is the focus and the important and the important part. And I think as the conversation continues, you can see why 80% of apprentices have leave inserts. Mm -hmm. Because what you're talking about there with the 70% pass rate is a very high standard, you know. So, yeah. And we would hope that if you're doing your research and you're asking your questions, that this doesn't come as a shock. That you, you know, you have that awareness and knowledge before you begin your apprenticeship. Is there an age limit for doing an apprenticeship? There's, there's at currently in the traditional craft apprenticeships, there's no, there's no upper age limit at the minute. So maybe if you were working for the last five, 10, 15 years, that maybe you, you want a career change. So an apprenticeship might be an option for you, or maybe if it, it could develop you in your, in your future career. Uh, there is a minimum age, uh, 16 years of age. But again, that's dependent on the employer or the company or his or her willingness to go on as an apprentice. So they may set the criteria for that also, so that you need to do a wee bit of research on that. Uh, then with the newer apprenticeships, again, the age different varies. So maybe Lorraine, you'd be best place to talk about the newer apprenticeships. Yeah, again, it's just going back to the, to the research. You know, they do vary. It can be over 18 for, for a large number of those uh, as well. Um, and we would find in general, apprenticeship recruitment would be um, you know, over 18, um, because a lot of them, as I say, we've already established that, you know, they've done their leave insert, so that's the bracket that they that they would be in. So there's no upper age limit? There's no, that's no, the good news. There's no the upper age limit. <laughs> no upper age Brilliant. Limit. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Great. And I suppose maybe linked to that in terms of some of the questions that come through quite often would be, look, is it challenging for women to maybe consider an apprenticeship? In the traditional crafts, the numbers would show that it definitely is more challenging. But um, there has been, uh, you know, a change in that in more recent years. Thankfully, more, more women are in, uh, interested in pursuing the, the traditional areas. And with the wider, I suppose, expanse of the apprenticeship moving into other occupations as well, um, across the various sectors from ICT to finance numbers there recently in apprenticeship we, we surpassed in Ireland the 1,000 number of women that are actually engaged now in apprenticeship 
So that was historic. You know, hopefully it's an upward trend and we will continue to, you know, to try and move in that direction. There's also a bursary. There is a, um, the government have a national, um, I suppose, an incentivization plan in place to encourage uh, women to become apprentices in traditional areas. So that's €2,666 um, and it's spread over a number of phases and it covers the traditional crafts. And that's important. It would be important for, for any um, females wishing to pursue a career um, that they're aware of that bursary and if they want more information, they can contact us because it's, you know, it, it's something to, I, I suppose, to tell employers, you know, when they're, when they're making their pitch. It's something that, that, that would be important to be aware of. So it's great to get that fascinating insight there, Lorraine, that as the apprenticeships have broadened and expanded, then the, the numbers of women engaging has definitely increased if we're hitting over a thousand. But, uh, you know, that, and we are doing our best to encourage women into the traditional trade crafts as well. So thank you for that. One of the, the questions that comes up a lot is, look, would I get any support or financial support um, when I'm engaging with my apprenticeship? Well, in terms of financial support, I mean, um, the apprenticeship is an earn and learn model of training. So you are um, earning the whole way through your apprenticeship from the day that you commence the employer and officially commence your apprenticeship for the traditional crafts. While you spend certain blocks away from your employer, the employer doesn't have to pay you for those, but you get paid an allowance by the state when you're away uh, and also an accommodation allowance when you're away from home. The new apprenticeships have a different model, but the employer still pays you for the duration um, and the entirety of your of your apprenticeship. In terms of, of expenses around uh, maybe when you're attending your college element, like all students, their student fees um, attached. Uh, apprentices are usually there a shorter time than the, the, the normal academic year, for example. It starts in September and would go on till May or June. So they pay a pro rata, so it's a, you know, a percentage based on the time that they're there. Uh, for the traditional crafts, that's usually about a thousand euro um, for phase four and then another thousand for phase six but because uh, i suppose i can't really be specific for the the newer models because there's different periods of time some are 15 weeks some are online so they all have different amounts that's payable in terms of student fees uh, i suppose unlike other students though apprentices are getting paid from when they commence their um, apprenticeship right through to the end so they should be in a position to save for that payment um, you know, over the period of time that they're there. And sometimes employers do decide to help and contribute with those fees as well. So that's just important to be aware of that. In terms of the other supports that, you you know, you mentioned, um, say, for example, somebody has a, a difficulty maybe with dyslexia and have had uh, support at second level for either junior cert or leaving cert, then those supports can continue into their apprenticeship journey as well. It would just be important that they would let their um, advisor, their senior training advisor, like myself, know that they would also uh, let their employer know and their tutor or lecturer, instructor or whoever they have when they're on their block release as well. Um, we would need to have documentary evidence um, around that. So uh, if something from their secondary school to say that they had, whether it was a reader, a scribe or extra time for facilitating the exams, you know, whatever, whatever they had in their second level education, that can be um, progressed as well, Deirdre, yeah. And I suppose then, uh, finally, a, a question that we would come up with a lot now or that we would hear a lot now is, look, I'm here that in these new apprenticeships, you can get a degree without having to go to college. Is that accurate? Yes, there are degrees available in the new, uh, in the apprenticeship model um, at the moment, Uh but all would require some element of whether it's blended learning, online learning, or actually physically attending college. Um, you know, you will have to attend in some fashion. Um, you may still be based, you know, in your local uh, working environment. Uh, if you're, you know, living in Dunlow and maybe working in an insurance office, it's quite possible that you could go through your insurance practitioner apprenticeship. It's a level eight degree in three years, attending live streamed lectures um, one day a week from that office and that is possible uh, but you have to bear in mind that even if it's a degree and you're doing it um, remotely or distance and, and uh, not having to physically attend you're still balancing all the apprenticeships you are balancing um, you know a full-time course essentially with a full-time job uh, you know the degree the standard in the degree isn't any lessened it's a QQI award at whatever level and standard that, that is applicable to it um, should that be uh, seven, eight, nine, even ten for a PhD. You know, it's about being aware that that commitment, that you have to make that commitment 
and engage with the course and be able to have you know good time management skills to facilitate you with meeting the demands of an employer in an in employment setting and then also being able to do all the coursework and the assignments and attending lectures whether remotely or otherwise that are required as part of that program. So I think once again you know we're back to the research that's not for the faint-hearted. It's not. You know you're undertaking a level eight qualification and you're working. Yes. Now your work may be related to it but the employer's work still has to be done there so yeah yeah, yeah. And, and you know it is um it, it is demanding but it's not undoable there's you know a, there's a lot of positives to that as well yeah. you know it can mean that you are you're still local um you're able to participate in whether you have community activities volunteering activities home commitments family commitments sporting commitments you know that uh, and you don't have the additional costs of um going away to college for long periods of a full academic year as such, a lot of them would be less than that. So, And the real beauty of that, I suppose, Deirdre, is at the end of that process, you still have a job. You know, somebody going through a third level institute yeah. has the degree, but they don't actually have the job. And it could take them some time then to secure that. So, you know, it's a really good model. You're earning a wage all the time and you have a job at the end of it. You know, and then you have your qualification and you might decide to stay with that employer or you might decide to test the water pastures new, you know, you have those options. So it's a fantastic way of um, achieving your degree if that's what you want to do. I think you've really given us a good insight into the range and depth of apprenticeships that are available uh, in terms of the levels of qualification. We're going on the national framework from level five to level 10. So there's something there for everyone. Um, I suppose if I were to ask you then in final summation, if there was... One really positive thing that you could say about the whole idea of apprenticeships and the, the system, what would it be, Tara, if, if I started with you? Yeah, well, I suppose the one the one thing that I would say to young people is it's a really excellent way, I suppose, to to follow a career. And when you look at somebody, particularly school leaver, you know, their leaving cert curriculum doesn't always, you know, you might have an idea of about the type of job that you want. Um, but if you look at it on paper, you might be very good at that on paper. It doesn't mean that you're going to be good at that practically. And the apprenticeship model is a really good way to find out we're better to learn whether or not you're good at something on the job. Um, the only thing I would say is maybe take that back a little step is it can take quite some time to secure the apprenticeship. So you want to be sure that it's the right one for you when you go to seek it out because they're not, you know, it's not picking them off the shelf. You don't get them too easily. I would say to a person, look to your ETB first. See if there is a closely related area in terms of a further ed program, further education training program that you could take up. And maybe through your work experience, whether that be a traineeship or a PLC course, that's the space. Test the ball or see if you have, you know, an aptitude for it and an appetite for it. And from that then start looking at your opportunity within the apprenticeship model, because you know then before you sign up to that four year apprenticeship, if it's a trade, a three-year degree, if it's one of the newer models, or maybe a four-year degree, you know what it is that you're signing up to and you're going in and the likelihood is that you'll see it through to the end. That would be my top tip. Uh, Anthony, as somebody who's been through the apprenticeship system yeah. and is now training up the next generation of apprenticeships. Yeah. Well, it's great. I, I totally agree with Tara and Lorraine. But as you said, probably I can look at perspective for a personal note. Uh, over the four years, you're going to work extremely hard. And we've talked about all the hard work and all the learning and the theory, but also you're going to have a lot of fun as well through it. And we have to say that, and you're going to meet people that you probably make friends for life with us also. So at the end of the four years, when you qualify, uh, you can practice your trade here in Ireland, or you can go to any ends of the, the world, from London to Paris to B Berlin or to Sydney, Australia. That's the opportunity that you've given yourself. Okay, so some crafts people may go into uh, project supervision, maybe project management, maybe health and safety officer, maybe an instructor, but they've done that because of the experience and the knowledge they've gained from the apprenticeship. Whether they're a qualified motor mechanic, whether they're a qualified plumber, whether they're a qualified electrician, or whether they're a qualified carpenter joiner. I suppose, uh, pardon the pun, but you'll open more doors in your working life than you'll ever close. Okay, so if you think, if you've listened to today, and if you think apprenticeship's still for you, then my advice to you, just go and do it. Brilliant. Thank you. Lorraine, with your vast experience and knowledge? Um, I would say perseverance, you know, just to build on, on what they've already said. As Tara said, it's, it's, it's not an easy route sometimes. Um, it can be difficult to secure a, an employer. The rewards are immense. Uh, you have lots of opportunities when you open those doors. 
and and you can also you know you can aside from setting up your own business or or going abroad and uh, you can go on to further and higher education again and you know um I've had some apprentices that have done not one but two um traditional crafts for example and one of them did um metal fabrication and then refrigeration and air conditioning and then went on to the boats and, and is now a marine engineer you know with huge earning potential in, in all of those roles um and and occupations so perseverance i would say um you know is is one of the big things you have to persevere at school through subjects that you might not you know overly be um enjoying at the particular time but if your end goal is an apprenticeship bear in mind that employers do look at maths for example you know your level of english communication skills are important persevere when you when you're looking for an employer because it's not an easy task to find one but uh, don't give up because lots of other people have done it and if it's what you want keep at it use the supports and resources around you in your network persevere when it comes to the program itself and if you're challenged when you're on it make sure that you let tutors lectures your peer group know and take the supports that's available there for you and enjoy that would be the best that's that i suppose perseverance and, and enjoy at the end of the day would be what i would say brilliant so I suppose we're hoping that we've given you some information, some guidance and, uh, you know, really just if this is for you and you're not sure what to do next or what your next step is, then by all means get in touch with us at Donegal ETB. We have our apprenticeship support team there. So if you'd like to know more, contact the FET section of our website. All the contact details are there. And really it's just for me to say thank you very, very much to my colleagues today, to Lorraine Murray, Senior Training Advisor to Anthony O'Donnell, who's our Carpentry and Joinery Instructor in Letterkenny, and to Tara McGuire, who's the Fed Recruitment Officer. Thank you. Mm -hmm.